the look they're on. Okay, at 6 o'clock, I would like to call us to order in accordance with South Carolina Code of Laws 1985, Section 30-4-80-E. The following will be notified of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting, the Herald, the Charlotte Observer, CN2, and WRHI. If I could ask you all to please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. We'll now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, as I just mentioned, we do have some new technology. This is our first time. It's a little bit of a test for everybody. Um, I hope those of you who are watching at home um, will get a better uh, at home experience. We sort of jumped into live stream on the fly and weren't really ready. So now we have new technology that um, should be more appropriate for everybody watching at home. Um, in, in addition, those of you who are in person, you'll notice the room is configured a little different. We have the podium in the center and hopefully you'll find your way to it when that time comes. Uh, the first item here is the approval of the agenda. You've all been given a copy. Were there any adjustments or corrections? No. No. Uh, I'll stand with, do you want me to put that? Do you need the to? DC, I don't know. Do you want me to make a motion to add that report? Sure. Michelle would like to give an update on her recent visit to D.C., so we're going to add that as a, I don't know, I'm going to call it 8.03, if that's okay. Go ahead. That's fine. All right. Uh, in that case, we will consider the agenda approved with that small amendment. Um, but we are going to start with some exciting special recognition. My turn. Yes. Don't hit the turn. unmute button, right? That's right. They're okay. all on. They're on. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. And this is always a special. Ooh, I think here. This is a special night when we honor our longstanding employees. I think we're honoring the 25 and 30 year folks tonight. You'll see several names on there, and you'll recognize them if you've been associated or involved with Fort Mill Schools. Uh, we take pride in trying to provide a, a, a favorable workplace for our staff, leading salary in York County, one of the top five in the state, uh, outstanding schools, new, newer buildings, uh, outstanding working conditions. We do that to entice people to come here and to stay. I will say we're fortunate in we've had a good retention rate through the years. Uh, I think last year it slipped a little bit. This is the bad part of the presentation. Uh, we were, were hovering about 9%, and I think it went to 17 A lot of our younger teachers are leaving the profession, and I hope and I pray we have more nights like tonight going forward. Uh, but uh, So my, it is my prayer that more kids get interested in education and join, join into this, uh, this God's work. Okay, at that, I'm going to step down front, and we're going to announce the folks, and Christy and I are going to hand out awards. Hand out awards. Okay. Okay. For 30 years, Judy McManus. Year awards, Susan Balsinger. Sean Kearney. John Gibson. Patricia Granger.
Michelle Greitz. Marjorie Groom Smalls. <laughs> Patty Jarvis. Lisa Knight. Okay. Shannon Marie. Aaron Owens. Katie Quinn. <laughs> Heather Ryan. Jacala Richardson, Lucy Rossler, Heather Spittle, Julie Warner, Uh, at this time, we're going to honor the Nation Ford High School JRTC for recognition of the honor unit des designation. We're going to ask Sergeant Major Logan to come forward and speak to their to their award. room and the reason I say that is because this award is their award um, the McRae is an annual award that is given out to JRTC only four units in the United States earn this award annually and that is the number one unit in each of the four geographical regions we are region two which means we are basically the southeastern United States of America and we were named the number one unit out of 69 units in that region we're also the largest region that is due to their efforts. They are the ones that coordinate everything. We are a cadet-led and cadet-driven unit. 
Colonel and I, on a good day, we just sit back and we do little rudder steers and they <laughs> run the show. These are our four top leaders in our unit. We have our commanding officer, Cadet Ryan Pullen. We have our Cadet Executive Officer, Cadet Jada Baldwin. We have Jennifer Zermino, who is our Cadet Operations Officer, and our Cadet Battalion Sergeant Major, Cadet Anderson. They are with us tonight. And they are the ones that run the unit. They direct the cadets in what we're doing. We had over 5,000 hours of community service last year. Um, we make a lot of things happen, and it comes down to them and their willingness to get out in the community and do something with their lives. Um, I always say 10 years from now, when they're long gone, I really don't care less if they remember how to do a right face or a left face. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care if they remember who the first commandant of the United States Marine Corps is. But I do care that they are people of character who are grounded in integrity and work ethic. And that's what we're striving to do. So. <laughs> Take one more, guys. Our next item on the agenda, while not officially a recognition, feels like one because we love to see the recognition of, of what's going on in all of our schools. We've got a school spotlight. Um, this month is Pleasant Mill Middle School, and I will allow Ms. Corey Husted to start us off and talk about how you're going to take us through your organization. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and good evening, everybody, for coming to Awesome school at Pleasant Knoll Middle School. Also, our impactful programs that we have and our inspiring teachers that we have. And we have a super cute presentation for you today. You'll see it in a second. There we go. Like it already. Awesome. Okay. You said. Okay, I think there's one in between. Is there, a pre is there a slide in front of it? Okay, well, the, the next slide that was supposed to be up there was a charger, and so I was gonna ask you guys to raise your hand if you have a charger, either right now with you, in your car, in your office, beside your bed, just a regular cell phone charger, you probably, there we go, there we go. We're probably guilty, and so we constantly are keeping our cell phone charged in because we want a high battery morning, afternoon, and evening. And so we're constantly staying plugged in. So at Pleasant Knoll Middle School, we wanna do the same thing with our teachers. We wanna stay plugged in. It's very easy to be plugged in in quarter one. We're excited to come back, but we really wanna push our teachers to stay plugged in, connected quarter two, quarter three, and especially quarter four. And so how we do that is three things. At Pleasant Knoll, we wanna have purpose. We wanna have passion. And most importantly, we wanna have the right people. So. We have a vision at Pleasant Knoll, and we want to ensure high levels of success, academics, behavior, social, emotional, athletics, artists, all around. And so we want that for all of our students, from all of our teachers, in all of our classes, utilizing all of our resources, and aligning all of our structures. And so this year, we have three key positions that have allowed us to power our vision and make it come to life. This is our lead teacher, our math specialist, and literacy specialist. We have had a literacy specialist at the middle school level, but this year is the first year we're excited to have a lead teacher and have a math specialist. So today we're excited to share with you about what this might look like in the middle school level and also at Pleasant Knoll Middle School. Now, I am biased, and I by far, I think, have the most incredible team that we work with. Um, Ms. Heather Pacero, Mr. Janowitz, Nick Janowitz, Abby Green, that's our literacy specialist. Ms. Heather Chesky, she's my lead teacher. Um, Lindsay Morgan's my math specialist. 
Sarah Barkley is my related arts department chair, the legend, Mr. Carrie Carey. My <laughs> yep, y'all know. And so they are my great team, but today we wanted to share with you about our three in particular in their new role at the middle school level. So we're excited for you guys to join us. Good evening. I'm Heather Vaccaro. I'm one of the assistant principals at Pleasant Knoll Middle School. Um, and so um, Ms. Husset just really introduced our support team that we have at Pleasant Knoll. These are, again, what she said were new roles that we have this year, our lead teacher and our math specialist. So I'm just going to share with you some of the great things that we do together. Um, Ms. Husset was so great to name me CI3T director. That was so nice of her this year. So the four of us really work together on we actually have our own PLT. Her, um, professional learning team. And together, we come up with ways to support teachers and ways to support our students. So we, these new roles that we have are ways that we can get into the classroom. So we are working together to analyze data. We look at SC Ready, Star Data. We are coming up with lessons. Our math specialists and our literacy specialists create lessons for our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers that they are using to um, have interventions in the classroom and during our SOAR time. Um, Ms. Chesky, our lead teacher, looks at that data she creates. She identifies those students that need those extra supports and interventions and puts them into those groups. Most importantly, they are the ones that are getting into the classrooms and helping support our teachers. They are collaborating in their PLTs. They are going into the classrooms teaching lessons, co-teaching, and pulling those small, small groups of students that need those extra interventions and preventions. Hello, I'm Nick Janowitz. I'm one of the assistant principals at Pleasant Hill Middle School. Leading into um, helping the collaboration between our CI3T team and our teachers, we have these intentional structures and programs at our school. These structures include our SOAR time every day, our professional book studies, character education lessons, data chats between our teachers and our students, and lastly, our professional learning teams. By aligning these structures, we're able to achieve the goal of providing our students and teachers opportunities of learning and achievement. The biggest role our CI3T team has is working within our PLTs. During this time, our lead teacher, our literacy specialist, and math specialist focus on supporting our PLTs through four guiding questions. We would like to share with you all how our new team supports school, our school, teachers, and our PLTs through the four guiding questions. Hi, I'm Abby Green, and I am the literacy specialist at Pleasant Knoll Middle. Um, in our PLT meetings, the first question that we ask and answer is what do students need to know and be able to do? So as the literacy specialist, I get to collaborate with ELA teachers in their weekly PLT meetings, um, but I also get to attend other PLT meetings um, to support literacy across all contents. In our positions, we also ensure that all lessons, assignments, and assessments are, assigned to, are aligned to the state standards, and we help with the implementation of the district pacing guides and provide support in planning engaging units. Finally, another aspect of our roles includes pulling resources and creating materials for classroom teachers. Hello, I'm Heather Chesky. I'm the lead teacher at Pleasant Knoll. The second question that we answer in our PLTs is how will we know when the students have learned it? In my role, I support the PLTs with this question by rotating through all core classes, I go through science, social studies, math, and ELA meetings. Within these meetings, we are looking and analyzing classroom assignments and assessments to see if the students have learned the content that we are focused on in that current unit of study. We've also created different trackers that we're using to help the PLTs dive deeper and review to really look at the questions to see are the students learning these questions, are they learning these standards, and if not, how are we going to revisit them? In my position as the lead teacher, I also analyze a lot of STAR and SE Ready data. I then present it with Ms. Morgan and Ms. Green. We take it to our PLTs, and we give the teachers information about their current students and their former students. This helps us see what 
areas um, our students are have a lot of strengths in and then kind of what areas they need to grow in along with our teaching. How are we doing teaching wise? What are our areas of strength and what are our areas where we need to grow? And then in addition to providing that information to the teachers, I also use the STAR and the SC Ready data um, to uh, uh, identify students who might need that additional support within our three tiers in our CI3T model. Hi, I'm Lindsay Morgan. I'm the math specialist at Pleasant Knoll Middle. And the third question that we analyze in our PLT meetings is what do we, what do, we do to support students who haven't learned it? And there's key pieces to this. The first is what Ms. Chesky mentioned, and that's data analysis. So my role in data analysis in the weekly PLT meetings is to look at assessments quizzes and tests that have currently been taken in the classrooms and help teachers identify students that are in need of reteaching or remediation. We then look at trends. Is it a large group within that grade level that is struggling with the concept? If so, Ms. Green, Ms. Chesky and I can provide remediation lessons. We can push in and co-teach in those classrooms. If it seems like it's more of smaller groups within different pockets of classrooms, we can pull small groups of students and work with them one-on-one. -on -one. We can push in and work with small groups of students. It really depends on the need within the grade, but between the three of us, it gives some flexibility. The second thing that we work through, um, Ms. Green and I work to create and design targeted intervention lessons for our SOAR groups. So our SOAR groups um, in math and ELA are intervention lessons, and we provide all the lessons, the activities, the materials, the supports that the teachers need so they don't have that in addition to their lesson planning. Um, and this also meets the need for our Tier 2 and Tier 3 students in CI3T. Hello, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm Sarah Barkley. I teach technology at Pleasant Knoll Middle School. I'm also the department chair for the Related Arts team and a three-time championship basketball coach. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that out there. Girls basketball has my heart, too. The fourth question that I'm going to talk to you all about is what will we do when students already know it? So when they already know it, we provide enrichments at Pleasant Knoll Middle School through our Related Arts classes as well as our core classrooms. In related arts, this could look like symphonic band, coding, shark tank, designing dream homes, as well as digital breakouts to uh, help with our healthy habits. In core classrooms, this could look like hydraulic battle bots, planning dream vacations, and wax museum. We also provide STEAM activities in our classrooms, and this can look like engineering car crash safety and science survivor. Um, I wanted to also note that uh, related arts teachers as well as core teachers uh, participate in our SOAR program at Pleasant Knoll. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tony Carey Carey, assistant principal at Pleasant Knoll Middle School. When I was told, I was told originally that I was going to be the closer. <laughs> so immediately I got excited, went right to my baseball days. I had this vision. I was going to be coming out here to Metallica playing Enter Sandman. <laughs> I had Mariana Rivera coming out of the Yankee dugout with the one hop and then jogging out here. And then when I realized that wasn't the case, I had a 20-second personal pity party and I moved on <laughs> to something that's way more important, obviously. When um, Talk about the connection. When, we have a great plan, no doubt. But as any of us know, when you're, you're part of a team, whether it's the business world, school, what have you, an athletic team, plans are great, but you can't carry out plans if you don't have the personnel. And that's the one thing that excites me most is that the plan that we've put together is fantastic, but more importantly, it's the people involved. We have fantastic families. Yeah. We have fantastic students. And we have a, a staff that is just willing to go the extra mile every single time. And we have a, and they're just wonderful people to be around. So when we come down and we talk about a plan, we have it, but we have the people. And that's the connection right there. That, that's how we stay plugged in. So um, that's all I have to say. And I will say this at the end. When you carry out a plan and you have people in place, it, it starts at the top. And, and Corey's an unbelievable principal in person. And uh, we all just follow her lead. Without further ado, oh, just make, knowing Corey, we got a couple activities. There's always going to be activities, so thank you. Okay, 
So at Pleasant Knoll, we do like to, uh-oh, yep, here it is. We do like to be a little corny, a few reminders, um, reminders throughout the school year to what is our power source. And so we did this with our teachers. I would love to do it with you guys if you will please join us. So we bought some power outlet covers. And so we want to encourage you guys to write down what powers you, what motivates you, what keeps you charged, whether it's the students, it's the teachers, it's each other, it's the communities, the parents. Maybe it's a quote. Maybe it's a certain student. Maybe it's your own kids. Um, and so just we encourage you guys to write down, not the superintendents. <laughs> Write down something that's going to inspire you, and if you want to, you can take out the outlet cover at your house or in your office and replace it with this. So when you're walking around and you feel like you're not fully charged, you might look at this, and then it just gives you that spark that you need to carry on through the day. So if you come to Pleasant Knoll, you might see some changed outlet covers. Um, sorry, Joe. <laughs> but we're staying energized, and we are staying plugged in at Pleasant Knoll. We love our students. We love our parents, and most importantly, we love our teachers. That brings it all together. And so we just thank you for allowing us to have these positions. Having these positions make our teacher's job easier and ultimately supports our students. So thank you. Hopefully you enjoy your, your power outlet covers. If you need an extra, I think we have two extra as well. So thank you, guys. Thank you. So, so I'll, just, I'll just share that something I'll write on my Thing when I can figure out the words is um, one of the things that really energizes me is seeing the results that our district gets and I'm sure that I, I won't steal all your thunder because you're probably going to talk about it later but you guys saw some amazing results in some recent reports so congratulations for that. All right we have to move on to real business. Um, <laughs> Our next agenda item is the approval of our minutes from September the 6th. You all received a copy. Were there any adjustments or corrections? Mm -hmm. All right, then those will stand as approved with, with unanimous consent. Um, the next section is our public participation. Um, as I mentioned, we have a new configuration, so this will be the new location for it. Um, I have four cards. We have a 15-minute uh, window, so we'll do four minutes apiece. Um, I think they're in the order that they were submitted, so this is the order that I will call you up. You can come to the podium state your name and address, and then your time will begin. The first one I have is Amy Bullris. I hope I said that correctly. Sorry, I did not. Hi, I'm Amy Bullris. Um, first, I want to begin by saying we appreciate all of your service to our community and schools, and I'm so thankful for my kids being raised in formal school systems. So thank you for all you've done. Um, I'm here to address a lot of confusion that is around the 2024-2025 school year calendar. Uh, parents want to make it clear what we were trying to say in the survey that you sent out before summer. It was our impression that the calendar options presented in that survey were the only two options you were considering, the only ones on the table. When we were being asked whether moving to a modified school year would be a modified year-round school calendar would be an acceptable change in our district. Um, many, of us, many of us were very excited about this proposal. Many of us weren't. Some of us didn't care because we were happy with both options. But I, what I can tell you is true of every single one of us is that we saw this as an exchange. We would give up a few weeks in the summer and you would give us back weeks during the school year for us to have off. Due to this understanding of the survey, when we said that these extra non-summer breaks had no impact or positive impact to us, we said this at in light of the fact that the in-year breaks were a week long. We could move our vacations from summer to fall or winter to spring. We could enjoy season breaks without taking our kids out of the education system we moved here for them to attend. We were not saying that these breaks wouldn't affect us, but we were instead saying that this exchange was an acceptable one. It's not negative because we gained something in return. I need to also address um, the remediation so, uh, stipulation. The majority of us who were voting were not voting on between the options to have a remediation schedule versus a longer summer school option. The vast majority of students do not need remediation or summer school. So when we looked at the schedule, we saw those as just weeks completely off. If remediation cannot be provided due to cost, we still would have voted for the calendar. This should have been the first thing discussed when it was determined that the cost of remediation was too high. By taking the calendar off the table because you could not accommodate a fraction of a percentage of your students with remediation, you were not considering the vast majority of the constituents you serve and the ones who voted for the calendar. To manage to a small percentage is never acceptable form of leadership. Lastly, I'd like to directly address the calendar that you did approve. The problem here is that you cited our survey responses as justification for this calendar. 
You implied that this is what parents expressed what we wanted. This calendar takes away two to three weeks of our family summer vacation. These are lazy summer weeks where high school students can get a job, families take vacation, sports are off season. You stress, exchanged these weeks off for stress, you exchanged these stress-free breaks off for both families and students for a series of four-day weekends. Unless I want to take my high school freshmen out of school next year, we cannot use these for vacations. Sports won't be canceled on a four-day weekend. Week-long camps are not available for four-day weekends. Students cannot get jobs over four-day weekends. Homework will be assigned over four-day weekends. All you have given us here is two extra days to have to find care, child care for our children as we cannot be constantly taking four-day weekends off. This is not an even exchange for parents. Let me close by challenging you to send another survey for parents to reopen this discussion. Ask us directly if this new ca in calendar impacts us negatively, positively, or not at all. I believe that the results of your new survey will confirm what 2,000 parents have said in a petition already. Our voices were not heard, they were misconstrued in the last survey results, and we are not satisfied with the calendar you've approved for the 2024-2025 school year. Thank you for taking time to listen to the parents of this district. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Fesco. Can I approach the board? Sure. Hi, my name is Rachel Fesco. Uh, I live at 16019 Kira Court in TGK. I have two children that attend TGK Elementary School. Uh, we were sent a survey on January 16th of 2023, which is on the left side that you have in front of you, which is the 90-90 split calendar that the parents were presented in the survey. The calendar that you have on the other side of the piece of paper is the calendar that was actually approved by the school district. As of today, we have 1,957 signatures on a petition respectfully requesting the board to revisit their decision in approving the current 2024-2025 school calendar. We fear that the current school calendar does not provide adequate breaks or rest for the students or teachers, which will eventually lead to burnout. We feel that the spring break presented in the current school calendar is too late and closer to the end of school than what, what would provide an adequate break for the students and for the teachers. There's also a number of four-day weekends that were presented, which Amy said homework will be assigned and teachers and students will not get an adequate break. The busy breaks do not replace the lazy summer breaks. We believe that families and teachers and students need adequate breaks during the fall, winter, and spring, and summer to fully recuperate and provide a better conditions for everyone in the community. We understand that the $250,000 remediation cost, but knowing the cost of hiring and training versus retention is not an adequate exchange. If you look at the trending number of students over the years, there's been a 5% increase in students coming into the Fort Mill School District. That would mean that in the 2023-2024 school year, there would be 18,755 students if the 5% trend holds. This would mean that the $250,000 remediation cost would only be $13 per student. What you have told the, your constituents is that a modified calendar with a 90-90 split break is not worth $13 per student. I would ask you to please reconsider the facts. Look at your budget, look at your students, look at what is going to help retain teachers, what is going to help retain people in this community, and revisit this decision and the vote that you took. The calendar that we, pre that we were presented in the survey was not the calendar that was voted upon, nor was it considered when you took your vote. We are asking for a survey to be resent out to the parents of the community. Ask if the current calendar that you have approved for the 2024 or 2025 school year serves your constituents. If it doesn't, then we're asking for a revote. And for the first calendar that you presented with a 90-90 split with the spread out breaks throughout the year, 
would be reconsidered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our, our next speaker is Andy Lytle, um, and I have some materials here that you provided ahead of time. Let me pass them out to the board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know this may be a little bit out of your jurisdiction, but I just want to make you aware of the numbers that I see when I interpret this report. Um, I'm presenting to you numbers that come from a professional consulting engineering company, Four Seal Fab. They're good numbers. I'm not arguing the numbers. I just want to highlight them so that you see them and kind of explain the part that I know about it. But before I run out of time, I want to ask you to please hire a third party consultant to review all this. Um, ask specifically for the maximum concentrated amounts of hazardous air pollutants around the area of the two schools. Um, you, want, you want to know the maximum concentrated amounts, and I'll get more into that. Um, Please show that you did everything in your power to protect our children and the heroes that teach them and care for them. Um, Silfab is a potential major source of air pollutants. The word potential is used because DHEC requires them to run the analysis as if they were 365, 24-7, running nonstop. When they, when they run those numbers at that capacity, their pollution, hazardous air pollutants are 204.3, this is on the second page of what you have highlighted in pink. Um, their total HAPs, hazardous air pollutants, 204.3 tons per year. Uh, so that they are requesting to be permitted as a synthetic minor source. Synthetic in this context means that they're man-made, uh, so there are man-made requirements put on them by DHEC, and those requirements will restrict their production. So they're at 204 potential, then they, DHEC restricts their production to one shift instead of three shifts, or one production line instead of two production lines, and when you do that, you can get their number down to 23. Um, not to mention the 10 ton per one, any single air pollutant, they're at 195 fully running. I don't know how they get that number down to below 10. Um, again, please get a third party consultant to look at that. Okay, um, these numbers are calculated from a computer model. Uh, the third page is a graph from the computer model or a map. Um, the computer model shows a 1500 meter border. Um, Within that border, I drew two red squares with red ink in the approximate location of the two new schools. The reason I'm asking you to ask specifically for the maximum concentrated amounts is because the purple dot receptors around the school area will probably have a higher concentration per hour than the ones on the outer part of the border. But the computer model totals all of those dots into the total 204. So you should be very interested in the concentrated amounts directly around the school. They're, they're going to be much higher per hour than I feel like would be safe. There is documentation out there that will tell you what is a safe level. You need your third party consultant to tell you uh, this is the estimated and this is the safe and if it's safe levels. But I do want to say the economic impact that Silfab promised will not be met at this restricted production level, because they're gonna to have to be restricted to one line and one shift to get under the 25. Right now they're at 204. When they're running full capacity, they're gonna be at 204. That's not a safe level in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I have one last card, um, Elena Bramo. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ellen Abramo from Mason Spend. Um, good evening, everyone. And uh, my name, again, is Ellen Abramo. I'm on the leadership team of Moms for Liberty York County. Please don't groan. I'm not here to be mean. 
right. It is my pleasure to share with you that uh, through the generous donation from the 917 Society, we have donated nearly 4,000 pocket constitutions to every eighth grader in York County. Uh, volunteers delivered these a couple weeks ago in anticipation of Constitution Day, and we did this last year as well. The Department of Education encourages the celebration of Constitution Day each year um, on September 17th to commemorate the signing of the U.S. Constitution in Philadelphia on September 17th, 1787. In the spirit of transparency, we would like to give each of you a copy of the pocket constitution that was distributed to the eighth grade students. May I approach? Then we got to work on the flow a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> you guys are the guinea pigs I tonight. Learned, I learned early on in teaching, monitor and adjust. So um, we appreciate and enjoy this opportunity and every opportunity as parents and as fellow educators like myself to assist our district to um, in the education of our current youth so that we can create good citizens for our future youth to look up to. Thank you for all you do for the youth in York County. Thank you. Okay, we've now got a handful of staff reports, action items, reports. So I think we start with Ms. Lordo with financials. Good evening. Um, tonight in your packet, I have the uh, monthly financial report for August 31st second month of the fiscal year, but first month of the full payroll when we begin to run the teacher payroll. So we really start seeing the impact of the new budget. Total revenue uh, to date was $19,310,512. Total expenditures, $23,518,686. But just to give you a feel with the new budget now, um, and August is a good month before we really get into what I call tax season. The monthly revenue is $9.7 million compared to the new monthly expenditures are about $18 million. So you can see from that that we are in a period of using the fund balance um, for August or to date. We used $4.2 million. And as you recall, we ended last June with a fund balance of $42 million. So it's very critical why we maintain that fund balance. And I always like to remind you in the public, um, August is a great month that shows from a cash flow standpoint why we do that. Um, I know that you like to know now what vehicle tax collections are. So once again, we had a record month. Uh, vehicle tax collections for August were $1,670,000. Wow. So we're starting to see that number um, on a regular basis now for our vehicle tax collections. Um, and August was also a month, even though it does not go through the general fund, it's a separate fund, but all of our teachers received the $350 from the state as a pass-through to use in their classrooms. Uh, so just as a reminder, the state did increase that this year um, to $350 from $300 in the prior year. So we hope our teachers were distributed those funds um, on their first contract day or by their first contract day. Um, so we hope they were already able to use those funds. And we do require a reporting of that um, for IRS purposes by the end of December. Um, any questions about the monthly financials before we move on to impact fees? I do. Okay. A couple of questions. First one is, so last year, um, there was the, uh, uh, you all, we began the new funding formula? Correct. Can you frame up what that looks like this year versus last year, please? Okay. So once again, um, we were not uh, a district that benefited from the new funding formula. Um, now that it is basically uh, a pot of money in the state that now gets distributed based on um, some weighted factors with our student counts, um, 
also poverty has a large impact on that formula and since we are still the lowest poverty district um, we do not come out favorably um, in that funding formula but we do now receive exactly one twelfth of the projections so we are seeing a little more state revenue coming in um, during this period started started in July and then once again for August then maybe we saw last year where it was more on a 10 month pay period instead of a 12 month pay period Leanne, can you sure um, if you know off the top of your head can you recite the is it like one and a half um, for for a poverty student compared to a one for a non poverty it's a one and a half yes it's a point five addition a 1.0 is a regular um, just gen ed, student. gen ed student across the board and then the poverty weighting increased from a point two to a point five okay. but when it did that a lot of funds then were distributed to other school districts in the state that were at higher poverty levels than we are here in Fort Mill and then um, one other question timing wise while we it's now a 12th for 12 months based on the number of students at what point in time based, so based on, on 135 based on the based on last spring's 135 day counts um, we're told once again that it will be um, redistributed at the 45th day and then once again this year in the spring at the 135th day okay which is a lot of uncertainty because it now depends on what every district in the state reports as far as student counts and weightings and we know that we've grown significantly since the 135th day but we're not getting the benefit for those in these first few of the correct time. until the 45th day okay. when the redistribution happens statewide okay. hey Leanne yes. when you speak of weightings is there any do, do we have any kind of accountability with what that actually means for, for districts like is there any um, is there any metric there yet it is there are a lot of different weightings um, related to our um, special ed programs there are some other factors such as students that are taking K courses or dual credit courses um, high achieving students um, we as a district are encouraging the state to do even more review of that because we think it's critical that every district is accurate and consistent in how they're reporting those numbers and so we are having some of those conversations with some of the state level um, personnel to encourage them to do more reviews of districts in those areas for that reason so currently it is strictly based off the district's word correct the reporting um, districts have various due dates on different pieces of that data uh, in different files that get uploaded and it is based on the accuracy of each district to report um, in their district for their students but what I think you also said is not only I'll call it the honor system as far as act, you know, reporting but also yes. not consistent um, metrics for identifying what makes one high achieving or what from my understanding there are some things that are um, very rigid as far as the metrics and then there are some things that are much more subjective as far as the reporting okay. and I would probably say we tend to be more conservative in our reporting from what I hear from other districts and as we look at the numbers statewide but I think with the new funding formula um, as we get more into it um, I think we will see some of these areas addressed more at the state level or we need to ask some what are they <coughs> qualifying as some of these categories and not be overly conservative if everybody else is counting it this way we need to count it correct this. absolutely Yes. I'm going to continue with my question. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so, could you help uh, folks that may take a peek at uh, this general fund here, uh, and kind of frame up? We're in the beginning of the the this this cycle, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a there's there's additional revenue. Can you Correct. frame that? Sure. So when I look at this, um, I see uh, I'm actually pleased to see that the additional revenue um, as of this August compared to the same period last year um, is spread out in several categories, which is the way we would want it. We're not dependent on any one area. 
Um, I'm seeing the property taxes have increased. Mm -hmm. And as I like to report out, I mean, vehicle taxes have had a big impact on that um, for us. I'm seeing the state revenue increase because the state did put more funding overall into the state education funding formula. So we're seeing both categories of the state revenue increase. And we're also seeing that interest on investments, which is a huge benefit, uh, what's happened in the, in the market and what we're earning on our um, cash invested as well. So that is a good thing, in my opinion, that it is spread out over several categories. Perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sure. I have one follow-up because I want to okay. talk about this and when we get to eight point something. Um, thanks. What is our, remind me again, please, what our percentage of local money makes up our budget versus state money? We're probably about 51, 52% local compared to 48, 49. We have definitely now shifted more local than state. But then what's the, what about the federal pieces? Federal in our general fund is 1%. Okay. I didn't know how small. Yeah, very, very small. And even outside of the general fund, uh, our federal funds are very low. Because once again, those are primarily based on poverty levels for the formulas. That seems contrary to what a lot of people in the public seem to think. Yes. How about let's talk about keep. what the people in Washington and or in <laughs> Columbia seem to think. But okay. I'll get there. Okay. okay, I'll move on to impact fees. So total collected to date, we are at $61,358,788. Um, the good news is uh, we have made three requests now to York County for construction costs related to new elementary school number 12. So we have requested um, 3,491,000 of that balance um, for direct reimbursement for construction costs for that school. Um, we saw August as um, a month where we did not have, or September is a month, we did not have a lot of impact fee activity, probably one of the lowest months I can remember in a long, long time. You saw that on the monthly report. We only had nine new homes that were permitted, or eight new homes permitted, and four multifamily apartments. So we only had 12 units that came on in August. Um, but our comparable data for 12-month rolling for single family, we were only one unit off comparing the most current 12 months to 12 months a year ago. And for multifamily, we were still about 57% less, because, but that's because of that large impact we had on one apartment complex. We're still in that period where that month is in the calculation. Um, our calendar year this year, 2023 average is 682,000. For September, we only saw 193. So once again, it's very much an up and down type scenario with impact fees. Um, but we are holding, we do have the 61 million that will directly go for construction of, of the new school. Uh, property tax notices. Um, the county has printed the property tax bills. You can actually see them. They're available online. Um, they will be mailing them, they told me, in the next few weeks. That was about a week ago, so we probably can expect them in the next week or two, but you can see yours online. I actually looked at mine and checked it. It's correct. I looked at some of yours, <laughs> and they're correct. <laughs> Just to make sure everything was um, input correctly at the county level. Um, but hopefully once those bills go out, we'll really see property taxes come in more in November and then certainly in December. Um, as far as our financial audit, our outside audit firm, uh, Green Finney Colley, they have been in the process of working on our audit, uh, what we call doing field work the last two weeks. And we are on schedule for that to be filed um, probably well in advance of the December 1st deadline. Um, and then the last thing I wanna mention, we did hold our training um, for our PTO, PTA Booster Club um, officers last week. Um, extremely well attended and we had, I'm so happy to say we had representation from all of our schools in attendance there that night. So we got a lot of good feedback and that group even 
um, said they would like to maybe get together more frequently or have some more trainings. And so we're working through that to see what we can do um, with still keeping the school district separate from them. But um, very pleased that it was so well attended. Um, David Phillips came up and did the presentations for us and walked them through what their required filings and some of the best practices for them. So it was a success again this year, I think. The word is definitely out on the street that that is a, an important training that they all need to be at. So okay. I'm glad good. they all showed up. Yes, yeah. they showed up. So it, it was it was really good and beneficial, I hope. So, okay, thank you. Questions for Leanne? Questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, in, a, in an unlikely turn of events, we've got four action items. We don't usually have four action items all at once. But our first one has to do with the jewels, jewel settlement, the case we've been talking about for a while. So our attorney, uh, Mr. Dave Duff and Gray Young are going to, or Dave is going to give us an update <laughs> on the latest on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay um, good evening, board members. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased, very pleased to advise you about a, a second settlement in what we've referred to as the Jewel Labs e-cigarette vaping uh, litigation that I think you may recall was, has been going on for several years in the federal court in uh, the Northern District of California. Um, the, the, the second uh, settlement was reached with uh, another defendant in that case um, by the name of Altria Group, better known as Philip Morris. Um, and uh, just a little history, uh, the Jewel Labs settled with uh, all of the, and, and more than a thousand school districts ended up being party plaintiffs or claimants in the case including, obviously, Fort Mill School District and several others in this state. Uh, Jewel settled with um, the, the plaintiffs uh, before trial. Um, and uh, in, in, I think, March, at your March 7 meeting, the board approved a, a gross recovery of $782,389. Um, <clears throat> more recently, uh, Altria uh, went to trial, did not settle initially, and a trial got underway in December of last year. And by the way, Wagstaff and Cartmel, which is the, the lead litigation firm that you retained, was the lead trial attorneys for the plaintiffs. And in the middle of the trial, uh, Altria decided to settle, and it was once again a, a multi-million dollar settlement with the, the plaintiff group. Um, and the, the portion of that settlement um, <clears throat> that this district will receive, assuming you approve the settlement tonight, is $115,176. So the, the, the total gross recovery from the two settlements is $497,565. Again, I, I say gross recovery because um, it, it will be netted to a lower number based on the Wagstaff and Cartmel and, and its litigation team's contingent fee because we've prevailed through settlement. And some litigation costs are also will be uh, re re taken out of that gross uh, settlement figure of four hundred ninety-seven thousand. Uh, I'm told that the estimate of what the district will receive, the net figure, is three hundred sixty-two thousand seven hundred seventy dollars. That's for both. For, for both. For, for, for both. and Altria. Yes. Yes. And. Um, You'll be receiving the, the settlement proceeds uh, uh, in a different schedule. Um, I'm told that uh, you will receive 65% of the Jewel Lab settlement by the end of the year. And the rest of it, uh, under the settlement agreement, will be paid in December of the following three years. 
I'm also told that the uh, settlement amount in the Altria settlement will be paid all at once in the first part of the next calendar year rather than by installments, so to speak. So, uh, you know, your choice is to <laughs> accept this settlement or you can continue to litigate with Altria in California, which I'm assuming you probably don't want to do. Uh, so I, and th this is a good settlement, um, and uh, I certainly advise and recommend that the board approve the uh, second settlement with Altria Group. Any questions I might answer? I, I have a question, and, and I don't know if you misspoke or I misheard, but can I ask you to, back to the jewel part before we get into to Altria. Right. Um, the, uh, mm -hmm. the settlement we were receiving, I see Leanne scribbling numbers, so, so yes, yeah, <laughs> so I want to make sure that we all have the same right numbers. The settlement agreement that we approved from Jewel was what amount again? Uh, Three hundred eighty-two thousand three hundred eighty-nine dollars. Okay, and I know we're it's going to be netted with with fees. I just want to make sure. I, I thought you said seven hundred and something, and I, that was more than I recalled. So that's why I wanted to double check. No, I, if I did, I misspoke. Okay. Seven hundred eighty-two thousand, and the total the total for the two settlements is four hundred. Ninety-seven thousand five hundred sixty-five, close to half a million. Yep. That's the ballpark number that I needed to hear. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. And it's to be used again to um, address the vaping problem, uh, remediate you know educational programs and vaping uh, detectors, whatever, however you might. And use the more it. that we can do that to get students right. to stop, not start. Right. Prevent it, deter it, the better. Exactly. Questions about the proposed settlement from Altria, not Jewel, which has already been voted on. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation of legal counsel to approve the settlement offer to the district by Altria Group in the Jewel Altria lawsuit by which the district will receive a gross recovery in the amount of $115,176, and that we authorize the board chair to execute the settlement documents on behalf of the board. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the settlement offer as presented. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and I will be happy to sign Okay, it. thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, our next item, these are kind of in no particular order, but uh, we're talking about field trips next. Um, <laughs> it just, uh, Dr. Waitz, this is going to come up as a, as a matter of course. We uh, require the board to approve any field trips that are longer than three days and or out of the country. So I think we've got a couple of those coming up. Yeah? We do. So good evening. Uh, tonight I am bringing six field trips that require board approval for your consideration. Uh, and as you just said, when the students miss more than three instructional days or international travel is involved, we do bring it for uh, your approval. So in your board packet, there's a document with a overview of the different trips I'm going to be talking about, and just briefly, I'll go over them. The first trip is for students at Fort Mill High School and Nation Ford High School. It is for travel to and participation in the National FFA Convention. The second trip is for students at Banks Trail in a visual or performing arts class. During this trip, they will attend classes on instrumental music, vocal and theatrical performance, and more. Uh, they will be traveling to Orlando. The third trip is for eighth graders at Forest Creek Middle School. They will be participating in a trip to Washington, D.C., where they will be visiting many of our national landmarks and learning about the, country, uh, the country's history. The fourth trip is for the eighth grade band and chorus students at, for at Forest Creek Middle School again. Uh, during this trip, students will be attending a music work workshop and visiting Universal Studios in Orlando. The next trip is um, eighth graders at Springfield Middle School. Uh, just like the previous one with Forest Creek, they will be traveling to Washington, D.C. Uh, to visit our national landmarks and to learn about our country's history. And then finally, the sixth trip on your document is for yearbook students at Catawba Ridge High School. They will be attending the CPSA yearbook convention in New York City. 
Uh, one thing I do want to point out to everybody is that while these trips do have a cost, there are scholarships available for students in need, and uh, those families and students could reach out to their teacher or administration at their school to learn more about that process. And I think every single trip also involves fundraising opportunities to help get the cost down. Uh, for some of the trips, the district does uh, sometimes provide some uh, of the funding if it's a CTE program. Sometimes we're able to provide part of that uh, for the schools. And uh, at this time, I'll take any questions for any of the trips. I have one question pertaining to the FFA convention. Um, I don't recall seeing anything on a request from Catawba Ridge. Do they not participate in FFA? Uh, not sending students this year. They are participating, uh, and there is a an ag class. Um, I don't know how. I would have to check with Holly Logan to find out their exact participation, but they do have an FFA chapter there. Yes. And, and I have a, a similar question. I, I know you bring these to us on a periodic basis throughout the year as the needs arise. Um, it comes up every time. I know we've got a couple of the middle schools with the eighth graders going to D.C. Um, I know there are other middle schools that often do the same that – aren't here, not necessarily implying that they're not taking the trip, but it just isn't in the sequence and timing to, to bring it to the board right now. Is that a true statement? Certainly. And some of them, they may not uh, require more than three days of instruction miss. That's a lot of the sometimes times. Sometimes they go over the weekend. Uh, right. Sometimes they go in the spring. So. Right, right. And a lot of the ones, like for the Washington, D.C. trips, it just depends on the availability from the different tour companies, because obviously that's a very popular trip, so sometimes it goes over four school days, and lots of times it's just three school days. So um, sometimes it's later in the year they'll get it approved, but mostly it's they don't require more than three days out of school. And that's the policy. You bring them to the board when they're three days overnight? If it's uh, if they miss more than three instructional days or if there's international travel involved. That's, that's why some of them may be shorter. Right. Than, you know. well, if they're over a weekend and they're only missing two days yeah. of school or whatever. Yes, right. Got it. And we do have a good number of those that happen over the weekend. Any other questions? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation of the administration to approve the six requested field trips as presented this evening. Second. Motion and a second to approve the six field trips in our documentation. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I? Just a small little thing. It, it seems like we used to on our, have on our table the number of students that would be affected. Can we get that added back if, sure. if we have ones going forward in the future? Sometimes it's only three or four kids, sure. right, that are missing. Yeah, that. I could, yeah. Instead of, you know, the whole eighth grade. Yeah, and I'll email you the numbers. I do have the numbers. I just okay. did not include it in there. Thank you. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> All right. This is a biggie. Uh, the next one, elementary school number 12 bid. Mr. Good evening. Romanek. Yes, before we get into that bid, I just want to uh, speak about the current budget situation that we're in, which is positive. I don't know we're in a budget situation. Um, so the original budget, and i got to take my glasses off, was 64665836 To that budget, we added $2.5 million because we had some um, grading from the middle school that we added to the elementary school because we had to get it done. We had spoken about that before. So the updated project budget all in is $67,165,836. Um, and tonight I'm here for you to approve the final guaranteed maximum price that Shelco had given us after negotiating with them. Um, so that is $56,258,614 total. Um, and then we have another ten million one sixty seven four ten other encumbered co in costs that include inspections, engineering, architectural, um, furnishings, etc. Gives us that grand total of the sixty six four twenty six zero two four. The good news is we're currently on the budget by seven thirty nine eight twelve. Note this does not include any funding for some of the extra work we're going to have to be doing at this, the um, intersection and road work on 460 that your county has made us implement before we were approved to move forward with this project. So that number can be anywhere between 5 to $7 million. Our civil engineers are working on plans for that right now. We won't know the design of that officially until January, so we won't have that number until then. So we will have to figure out Funding. Whatever the amount is, we'll have to figure out the funding for it, but Correct. we can't do it right now because 
we, we don't have a concrete number. That's estimate. correct. And, and we're still discussing, negotiating, working on. Well, we hope to speak to them about it, yeah. about would some like of the, the things. And to, what was that? We'd like the county to help with what they're wanting done and or others that are impacting that intersection as well. That's correct. Some of the other growth. So we'll be doing that in and the There's a penny short. project up there as yes, well, there correct, that will impact that area that this could be a part of or could have been a part well, of. Well, we hope, but it should have been originally because the folks that were here were supposed to do some upgrades to that intersection and never did. Right. And there's a couple other points that we want to speak about because of the, where the students are coming from. Some of it doesn't make sense, but we're working on that now, and uh, we'll speak further so about that. So to the pennies project... And, and I will use the, while it's been state, federal, and otherwise, the intersection at Gold Hill and 77. Okay. The diamond. We had pennies money for certain things that affected the Gold Hill portions of that to, in essence, have that ripped up to redo some of the other pennies projects that were done. Is the county planning to better coordinate so that we are not Paying ten million dollars. Let's use easy. Numbers. I can't answer that, I but obviously, know. but the, the improvements are away from the diamond, so there are they they do have some valid concerns about it, okay. getting traffic over seventy seven, keeping the flow going, etc. Certainly. But to the extent that they provided us the information they want us to update is a little bit overboard. We feel. Or I think even said differently that to the extent that that flow is caused by the development of this new school. Right, is, correct. That is part of the correct. question, That's right? As opposed to an existing challenge, right? Or any other projects that get developed at the old Knights Castle and other things that may go Which is part of just to school, right? That's correct. Yeah, that That's makes correct. sense. Mr. Well, Roman, yep. Sorry. Oh no, no. Go, having, go ahead. having sat at the diverging diamond yesterday, <laughs> coming off of seventy-seven, where traffic was never supposed to stop and back up. Um, I can tell you that the light turned green for people coming off of 77 to go westbound, and we got three cars through the light change, but there was never supposed to be traffic sitting there. So. Well, I'll tell you, from a personal perspective, it's been a godsend. <laughs> oh, uh, don't get me wrong. Because I, I it used to take you 25 minutes to go was, three miles, but it's correct? it's still not, there's I'll still, sit I think, the five a minutes. problem at Gold Hill right. and, <laughs> and Pleasant Road, quite frankly, because... It was backed up there from is. there to there the is. diverging diamond. Yeah. To be fair, I believe the project going on on the parkway with the pipes. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's created some of that. Because I was sure. waiting from yeah. Springfield this morning, way like 30 extra minutes just to get where I normally get in about five. And it was. I think wow. that contributes to it. Sure. Let's hmm. promise. Here, I'm going to continue oh, I'm sorry, my yeah, question. Sorry, Thank you. you. <laughs> so. The question I have is, can you share with the public, you mentioned the phrase, guaranteed maximum price. Correct. Can you frame that? So me? over the last couple of years, we have gone to a different method as far as procuring these services and this construction, these construction projects. Um, it's more, it's not just low price now. We go through interviewing process and qualifications and such to come up with the vendor we're going to use, who in this case, the winning uh, bidder, if you call it bidder was Shelco Corporation. And what happens is after they're named as the winning offerer, we're able to go ahead and negotiate with them. They go out, they bid 35 to 40 packages as far as the actual building itself, which creates lower pricing for us. Um, and then they come up to us, we meet with Leitner uh, Corporation and we're able to discuss it, see where we can make some changes to come within budget and help us with budget and such. So the guaranteed maximum price, once we enter into agreement with them, they cannot charge us a dollar more than that. Now, there may be change orders if we request something, changes to the sure, building and sure. such. But otherwise, everything is all in already, and they can't touch that number. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have a question. Golly. Um, that is a lot. Um, <laughs> when you are talking about the $2.5 million uh -huh. for the middle school grading, Assuming we have a bond referendum and our community votes to build that yeah. middle school, mm -hmm. um, would that two, like, are That's we asking for 2.5 less that in that referendum? Needed. That's correct. So 
we are probably already saving them to 0.5 million in what we're going to ask for, if we were going to ask for something. You can say that. And just for acute clarity, <laughs> um, we okay, are <laughs> intending to pay cash for this elementary school out, out of, the of impact, impact fees. fees. That's correct. And we were what were the what was the impact? Seven hundred thousand, I think you mentioned six fifty to seven hundred a month, yeah. right? Some so months. we have one million. And how many months do we have? And by the time by the time we finish, we still got we should have eighteen months. Seven. So months. all the new families in their beautiful new homes who are enjoying Fort Mill and all it has to offer, traffic, school. Right. Um, they are proud owners and contributors of Elementary 12, which I'm going to call Cash Elementary until right. we have a different name. <laughs> right. Yeah. I like that. Come for approval for that. Feet, right? <laughs> I can make that motion, too. If you <laughs> hey, Joe. Yep. Um, I got a question. So we have a maximum price of we're, we're Shelco. So underneath that, we got other contracts. Uh -huh. Now, so are those, so the inspections, engineering, architectural, uh, FFD, and the IT, are those also locked in? Those are encumbered. So we already have costs for all of those, one of them being an architectural improvement. Right? Okay. So we've paid that or on the way to finish up paying. That. Great. That's done. And, and some of the other fees and such. But we've taken that into account. Like, we don't have a contract yet for the furnishings, desks, and all of that stuff, but we know approximately how much it would be because we've spoken to these people already, so. Great, thank you. And and regardless, we we are only approving up to the amount, assuming we approve it here in a couple of right. weeks. Right, right. Wayne, right. I'm sorry. That's right, no problem. Ms. <laughs> Prominent, yes. we have discussed it, but I just want to confirm that this is for a 1,200 capacity elementary school. That is correct. So it's for the full Monty, not for a we can add on to it. That is correct. So if you compare costs out to things in the past, mm -hmm. besides inflation, you got a 20% right. capacity increase. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is an important distinction. In the past, right. we've built 1,000 capacity schools, right. and rather than building more frequently, the thought was build a little yeah. bit bigger. Yeah, and that's already been approved by you. So. Any other questions or discussions? Scott, you're the only one. No? Good. Good. Got nothing? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So, Mr. Romanek, yes. you would like this for the 56 number, or you would like this for the 66 number? No, the 56. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation of the administration to approve entering into negotiations with Shellco for a maximum guaranteed not to exceed price of $56,258,614. Correct. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Entering into, we've already entered in. entering, entering into a contract, well, not entering into negotiations, right? Right. This is the actual it's number. It's so been negotiated. This is a little bit different than a normal contract. When we chose them, we had to give them an upfront pre-construction fee. Them so we're contract adding. Contract for them to negotiate right. the There's no negotiations. Not agreed. It's done. Well, Shelco's negotiating. We are not. No, it's done. These are the numbers from the subcontractors. Okay, well then I'll come back and I'll do this again. <laughs> I would like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation of the administration to enter into a contract with Shellco with a guaranteed maximum price not to exceed $56,258,614. Correct. Second. All right, motion and a second to approve the recommenda recommended contract with Shellco Maximum bid not to exceed fifty six million and change. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. That motion carries. And then we're on to our last one. I, I guess this is me. Um, so we have a um, school board association annual uh, 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 conference. conference. Is what I'm looking for. Um, in December, where the school boards across the state um, vote on a number of things. We vote on uh, our officers for the coming year. Uh, we vote on our priorities, legislative priorities, um, beliefs, things like that that will, go, that will be used for the next year. And um, every district in the state has a certain number of delegates that are allowed to participate in the voting um, and discussion and um, adjustments and amendments and all of those things. 
um, our district is afforded six uh, delegates for the voting on um, these items in December. Just so happens one of the items that will be voted on in December um, is the incoming president for the SCSBA, of which we will be voting for our very own Michelle Branning to take that helm um, come February, right? No, it's actually in December. It actually takes effect. It actually it's takes effect okay. December 2nd okay. after the delegate annual conference. conference. Okay. So um, because we have six votes. Saturday after the, during the delegate assembly. And because um, six of us are not on the ballot, yeah. uh, my suggestion would be that the six of us each be a delegate. Sometimes we've had alternates or had one person just go do the voting on all of our behalf, but I would love to see um, if we could all be voting members um, since we have six spots, and that way we can all cast our votes for Michelle and all the other important things that happen. So that, that would be my recommendation. I don't know if I can make a motion. Certainly. Okay, I'm going to make a motion that we certify all six names up, up here except for Michelle Branning to be delegates and alternates in the event that someone is ill and can't attend for the Delegate Assembly on December 2nd of 2023. Second. I got my own motion seconded. <laughs> <laughs> for the six names up here except for Michelle to be delegates and alternates, is there any further discussion or questions about what I was talking about? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. All right. We'll see you in December. I'll try to make um, it painless if we could contain a sister district. We'll do fine. <clears throat> We'd be in great shape. <laughs> um, we've now got a superintendent's report. What's okay, up? Okay, we've got a lengthy executive session, so I'm going to try to get us on track a little bit here. Calendar events for October. Of course, the school board meeting tonight. Teacher work day on Monday the 9th. Uh, Old English Consortium training on that day for teachers. No school for students. Teacher forum leadership day on, and this is the day where we got school board visits and the teacher forum activities at the same day. So board members are invited to the 8 o'clock to 11-ish portion of the teacher forum leadership day. And then we'll go on the school visits at 11, starting at Springfield Middle and then Springfield Elementary, finishing at Nation Ford and Sugar Creek. Uh, we've done it that way for the past several years, I believe, as far as the order. Then on the 17th school board meeting, the second one of the month, if needed, uh, 26 teacher and support staff liaison meetings, which in the training and support center, and then the two-hour early release day on the 27th. You know, board members, I usually leave out some date that you may have on your calendar. So There is one. On the, the 19th, um, there is a most-of-the-day seminar that is being held in conjunction with school board association and municip municipal associations. So the, the county and cities and others will also be jointly holding um, a civility seminar, which um, I know several of us are attending, and I think we could all use a little reminder about some civility. So... Um, that is in Columbia on the 19th. And then, of course, Ghosts and Goblins out on the 31st. That's right. Anything else that y'all know about on the calendar? Hey, uh, yeah. So, Dr. Epps, you you mentioned a uh, school board meeting on the 17th if needed. So I know we had one. Our previous school board uh, meeting was uh, we did not have. And I know I got I got some meetings. Uh, I, got some, I got some emails saying, hey, I showed up. Nobody was there. <laughs> and so... Um, if we could, uh, if we do call that, if we could put out a uh, statement, just kind of blast it out to everyone, because I went back and I looked and I didn't really see anything that said, hey, that we were that we were canceled for our last one. Fair. I thought it I, got removed from the calendar. It, I'm, I was going to say, it probably was taken off the district calendar, but if one wasn't watching the district calendar, they could yeah. easily miss that. Um, clarification for, for those in the audience that may be interested um, the, the way the law is written and the way we, we have typically had two meetings a month because of just the sheer volume of things, but we are required to have one in all of the months that we are in school, which is why we also do, don't usually have one in July. Um, and while we often have two, we always try to mark the second one of the, meet, of the month as an as needed because when there's not significant business, it doesn't make sense sure. to keep all everybody late in the evening for it. For so sure. that's the reason for the cancellation last, last time. Especially since staff sits here through the whole thing. Y'all are so good. <laughs> good explanation, Chairperson. <laughs> Burning my pen. Right. The second meeting is if, as needed, and it seems like 90% of the time we need it. So. Yeah. Um, okay, other, other dates. 
Okay, let's talk about enrollment a little bit. Um, I, I hope this is this is a trend. We're in trouble, but I hope it's not a trend. <laughs> uh -huh. I noticed a plus 74 yeah. from month to month, uh, September to October. Um, typically, we trickle along during the school year, and I think that prior to that, it was another 50 or so. Um, I know we have the apartments and the new homes at Elizabeth, and I... I'm, I'm hoping this is just, um, and but you said there weren't many new impact fees, right, Leanne, this past month, which is? Well, because that's that's permits. new permits. permits. They're not necessarily Six ready to advance, take, give or take possession yet. Right. But there's three that I can think of and point to right now. There are three communities in Tiga K. One is a multifamily. There's at least three in Fort Mill in terms of, district lines or whatnot and then there is I think two maybe three that are coming around on uh, what would be deemed unincorporated York County so, yeah, so as those are completed there there will be additional enrollments I'm sure well and that means I'm gonna get to my 18-6 number real quick if I <laughs> yep. <continue>. uh, <laughs> my little notes. I'm bust that one out of the room no, no but problem. um I know the road the growth is continuing to come but and that just uh that shows that, I mean, it seems like there are additional houses at Elizabeth every day uh, yep. popping out of the green. Um, but so the 18405, you can see, um, if you see any bubbles in there, let us know. I think we fro the freezes are in place, right, Gray? At, uh, okay. So elementary, elder, elementary, elder, and middle, and second level. Yes, we're up to four now. And yeah, Riverview three. Kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, and then the teacher attendance winners uh, for the month, uh, Fort Mill High School was 94.6, Springfield Middle 96.1, this is teacher attendance, and the Springfield Elementary led the district at 97.5%, so great job, Springfield Elementary, all good there. Um, and I can not let mention the niche uh, report that you saw during the week. Um, I think it memory serves me. We probably, out of the last 10 years, have been ranked number one or two. I can't think of when we weren't one or two. We, we traded with Irmo one time, uh, maybe when y'all were first on the board, you and Wayne and Michelle. It's been a while. Yeah, a long time. Uh, but um, just what a tribute to our people and our, our staff and our parents and our teachers and our students. Um, number one school district. We were ranked high. I, I, I don't have it with me, but we were, and Joe, you may can recall some of them. We were one, two, or three in like in six or seven everything. categories. So. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't have a microphone back there, but top 2% in the nation, and I think that's pretty impressive. You know, people always want to say, yeah, but it's South Carolina. And number one in South Carolina yeah. is still very impressive, but top 2% in the nation yeah. is something to be proud of. So congratulations to everybody involved with that. Yep. That's, that's the bragging point, the bragging moment there. All right. Um, Michelle had wanted to mention yeah. real quickly that she was in D.C., I went to Washington, D.C. Monday through Thursday of last week. Um, so it was funny, to the top 2% in the nation and then top in the state, um, many of the other districts that I led on, I call it the tour guide, it's not really. I lead the discussion with, um, in this case, it was with Senator Scott's office and his staff and with... Um, Congressman Norman and his staff, and then I participate in some of the others, but I lead those discussions. Um, and so some of the other districts were like, oh, we're the number one district in the state. Oh, no, we're the number one district in the state. They all get done with their thing, and I'll come and go, y'all can say whatever you want, but I am the number one district in the state. <laughs> and, by the way, top 2% in the nation. So be quiet, because you're not. Um, and then we laugh, and then we get down to business. Um, so, as you can imagine, Senator Scott was not present. Um, he typically is. He's one of the few senators in my time of doing this, and it's been about, I think, 11 years now, um, that he tends to always be there or at least pop in. Um, he's got a teacher, a former teacher now, that is his lead staff person. We call them staffers. Um, where education is concerned, and she was fabulous. Had a great dialogue with her. Um, she was shocked to hear that our federal budget is so small and that we don't really get a whole lot of anything. But we did talk about what does that impact look like 
um, with a government shutdown, which was averted, but we did talk about that quite a little bit. But at the same time, it was, look, we know that's all here. It's facing us, but that's not why we're here, and that's not really what we want to talk about. These are the things we want to talk about. Um, and we talked about um, broadband. We talked about IDEA funding and not funding, and you know what I do. So it was great. I had a great time with it. Um, and then from there, we were taken through the tunnels. If you have never been to D.C. and done some of this, there's some really trick stuff that you only get if you know how to navigate this. Um, so there's tunnels that go from the Senate side. Senate side's on this side. Capitol building's in the middle. And then the House side's on this side. And there's tunnels that go underneath. And so we were escorted underneath and over to the other side. Um, I got to see Ralph, Rep. Norman. Um, I missed Elaine, Mrs. Norman, by... Um, a day. She had been there for the weekend for something and, and I missed her by a day before she came back. Um, but he was there. We talked very briefly. Um, he needs to be brought up to speed still and recognize and understand a little bit more um, where the state budget goes, where the federal budget goes, and and some out of out of step conversations, but it was fine. His staffer is a person who's actually from Rock Hill. Um, who is now up there, and we had a great discussion on that particular one. I didn't have anybody else from the state that joined me, so it was um, just Michelle with Dave. It was great. Um, so we talked about, you know, how does the state budget impact us, because he's very concerned and, and curious about that, and, and I was real close on my numbers. I told him we were 54% local. Um, I was close, and, and he was in complete shock that that our local funds our budget the way that it does compared to the state budget and the changes that have been made to the state budget and how that goes um, and and the poverty weighting and so on. I mean, I, I kind of left nothing uncovered because he wanted to know how that interrelated. And I'm like, okay, but well, this is great, but this is all about the state. And let's talk about what you're going to do for me on the federal level. Um, and I need that IDEA funding because... I've got more kids coming because we are the fastest growing district and I can't keep up with them because of not having enough staff and not being able to get staff. And oh, by the way, I can't pay them when I can get them because they can make more in the private sector. And they were like, wow. So in any event, it was productive. Um, I am absolutely not going to sit here and take credit for averting a shutdown, but hey, y'all, we averted a shutdown and I happened to be in DC when that happened. So um, so it was, it was productive. Um, it was great time to just share the good message of the things that we're doing here and, and to kind of brag on all of y'all that are out here because it's what you all do that make everything else look good and make our senators and our congressmen kind of go, wow. So thanks, y'all. All right. We are in need of an executive session to receive personnel recommendations, discuss legal issues and contractual issues. Motion to go into executive session. We are in executive session. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, hopefully this was a good experience for those who were watching.